Thank you all for joining us today on Public Square. I'm so excited that you can be here. We're talking about bullying. I want to start off talking to some people who've experienced this personally. RJ, yeah. you are well known to all of us as an actor here on Breaking Bad, but you went through a lot of bullying in high school. Can you talk about that? I actually wasn't even in high school. Really? It was I earlier. Was, I was sixth grade. Oh my gosh. Um, I had my hand broken um, because I was actually um, playing basketball. I was up by two points and the um, kid didn't like it so he smashed my hand. He had a um, metal tip, like at the time it was really popular to have metal tip shoes on. So um, he used it. <laughs> I've, I dealt with name calling. I, it's like I was always having one lung issue after a heart issue after all this, so it was like I always had some machine strapped to my body. And why did they target you? Why does anyone else get picked on? Is because they're weaker, they're smaller, and there's more than one person. Like it, it's that's like really the main reason why I was probably picked on. Is it also because you had a disability? I know that kids well, are more subject to bullying because well, of that. Well, it gets back to the weaker thing. Mm -hmm. They looked at my disability as a weakness, and they, they just took it and ran with it. How did it impact you as you went through school? I actually didn't look at it as bullying. It just looked at it as something else I had to deal with and get over and overcome. And it's what, that's what we really need to tell our kids is once you stand up for yourself, no one will bother you. All you have to do is stand up one time. Is, did you tell people when it happened or did you think ah, it was I, I confronted people. I told my friends. My friends all told me to go to the principal. Did you go? Yeah. What I had no problem. He, he uh, kid got expelled. Okay. It was the ninth time he was expelled from a school. Brian, can you talk a little bit about your experience, which was a while ago, right? But yes. it's still impacting you. Can you talk a little bit about what happened to you? Sure. Um, Um, my bullying started um, when I was nine years old, and uh, so it's affected me my whole entire life. Obviously, um, I've never dealt with it. Um, I always thought I was alone. And um, I had no idea that other people went through the same thing I did. Um, I dropped out of high school because um, I was tired of dealing with it. Um, so I would call my parents and um, tell them I was sick. Um, but that's the only thing I ever told them. Even today, they, they still don't know the story. It's important for me um, to let people know that um, this isn't kids being kids. One thing that I'm, I speak very loudly about is the zero tolerance policy in schools. Um, I was trained not to fight, not trained, but taught. Um, it was always taught in my house that you don't fight no matter what, you do not fight. So I was very small as a child. Um, when my bullying started, I was in fourth grade and I weighed 45 pounds. Um, when I get bullied and beat up, um, is a better way to put it than being bullied, I was just beat up. Um, and I would just stand there and take it or be walking away as I was getting beat and I would get taken to the principal's office and I would get the same punishment as the person that beat me up. And it is absolutely unacceptable. It's still being done today. Um, an example that I like to use, especially as a police officer, is if I responded to a domestic violence situation where a husband beat up his wife and I took her to jail and then she had to serve the same sentence as the person that beat her up, the community would be in an uproar. And that's the same thing that we have to do for these kids with the zero tolerance. We can't continue to tell kids that it's kids being kids, it's child's play, it's teasing. 
learn to get along with people, it just does not work. Um, so in adulthood, I live a life that um, isn't who I am because I have to withdraw myself and protect myself from what happened to me as a child because I've never gotten over it. Um, so every time I go outside, every time I leave my office to go talk to somebody at work, um, every time I talk on the phone, um, everything I do has to be a calculated move before I do it because I don't want to be noticed. Um, and I've learned that the more invisible that you try to be, the more visible you are to everybody around you. So it just counteracts what I'm trying to accomplish and just be invisible. D, you've had a child who was bullied, and then also you said she started becoming a bully. Yes. Can you talk about how you handled that? My daughter um, is in fifth grade, and a couple of years ago the bullying started, and then she started acting out like a bully herself, and was probably called a bully, and in fact I called her a bully, and my husband and I did in a meeting with our principal, and we were told that there weren't any bullies in the school, and I said, but my own daughter is one, I'm saying she is. We just had to work very, very hard under our roof to put a positive spin on things, and in everything we talk to her about, we try to say, you don't understand what the other person is going through. You need to have some compassion and understand that people are different and accept people for who and what they are and respect them because they are other human beings. We are on her constantly because she was a sweet little girl and just overnight she started doing things that we never dreamed our daughter would be doing and acting out and we decided that the bullying cycle is going to stop at our house because she was a victim who became a bully and that's what happens. What were the indications you had first that she was being victimized and then she was doing it? Um, nightmares, oh. panic attacks, lashing out over nothing. Her anger just goes from zero to ten in nothing flat and we just talk and talk and talk and talk about everything to try to make sure she's not holding anything in because kids don't talk about this because they're afraid. And are they you, afraid I, of you or they're afraid? No, of they're okay. afraid of the perception and everything that goes on around, around them and for fear of retaliation also. It's just a daily battle. My nine-year-old daughter had a knife pulled on her at Pajarito Elementary and was threatened by the bully that he would kill her if she let anybody know that he had a knife. She was smart enough to get out of class and make her way to the office to let the principal know that this child had a knife. She has also suffered from panic attacks, anxiety, nightmares, and started lashing out and being angry. Like Dee said, she went from zero to ten you know, in no time. She's experienced bullying in other ways at, you know, with school. Kids telling her her clothes wasn't good enough, pushing her, stepping on her. But the knife was the scariest situation. What did you do? Pulled her out of the school because the child that threatened her was allowed to come back to school five days later after spring break, and I didn't feel that that was okay. How did it make you feel as a parent to know your child was going through that? Sad. School should be a happy place. Your kids shouldn't feel threatened at school. That's a place they should want to be. And I knew something was happening when every morning she was sick. She didn't want to go. Teachers and principal, the principal never believed me until my child actually threw up on the principal's shoe one morning and she said, okay, we have a problem. Torin, you started an anti-bullying club. At our school was we started a club called the Anti-Bullying Campaign. And um, basically what our club did, we did three major things. We spread awareness, we were able to get more reported cases. So like how Dee was saying, her daughter didn't want to tell her, we're kind of breaking down that wall and kind of making, or helping children understand that you can talk to adults, you can talk to a teacher or a principal, and it's gonna be okay. And we also started to increase peer-to-peer -peer intervention. So like say me and RJ, we are bullying you for some reason, and Dee is our friend, and she'll say, hey, that's not right, what are you doing? That's weird. That young people will think, okay, one well, of our peers is saying that 
we're doing something wrong, we should probably stop. Because peer pressure is very, very uh, powerful. I've seen your program. It, it, wor it works. Because oh. really what we need is just one voice. One voice to tell the bully that the bully respects. Yes. And if, uh, say, one person says something or one person speaks up, imagine if five people speak up or ten people or an entire crowd. And if, say, a school of 100 kids, there's one bully and 99 kids, kids say, we don't approve of this, you need to stop. Now, I know that kids be seen as bullying itself, but really you're trying to say, hey, this is wrong. We can't be like this. Brooke, you, there's something similar that APS has called the Ambassadors that's part of the larger Safe Schools program. The idea that you engage those who are influential in a school and have some ability to make change. You teach them skills on how to engage their peers to stop mistreatment before it escalates into something more. And then they practice those skills and then you send them out. and. Um, they initiate and, and, and use the skills. We also, there's a part of the program where you're engaging with adults, and so you're building relationships and building those protective factors. And we have the Safe School Ambassador Program in six schools in Albuquerque Public Schools and the middle schools. Could you give us a better idea of why bullies target certain people? I mean, Studies uh, show that the primary re reason that anyone is, is targeted for bullying is that in some way they're different. And so all the things that people have said about you know, we, building, building up some of those resiliency skills, building up empathy, those are all of the key components in addressing any type of bullying is that one, developing a sense of, a larger sense of acceptance for others and a, um, an appreciation for difference. Because any time, any level, any type of difference, there's obviously a dynamic of power as well. So when RJ mentioned, you know, that if someone sees someone as weak, then they're likely to be targeted. But it really could be any, any, anything that made someone different could lead to them being a target of bullying. Dr. Pierce, can you talk a little bit about your work? We provide same-day suicide assessments for the school district. They can call and say they have a child at the school with suicide ideation. And we do about 800 a year, which is a sad statement that that many kids How many? How dealing, much is bullying component? Um, in the elementary and middle school, 46% attribute bullying and the experience of repeated bullying at school as um, a significant factor in why they feel suicidal. Um, at the core of it is humiliation, um, is part of it, and there's nothing worse than being humiliated. Um, as Brian very courageously was sharing, it's just, it's very devastating and it's hard to talk about. You're even humiliated to tell others why you're being bullied or what they're saying so you don't say it. And a lot of kids will, on impulse, go from a bullying situation where they're being bullied and literally do self-harm behavior or make attempts. Um, I really want to bring the perspective of um, we can do a lot about the bullying, but one of the things we really need to look at is understanding why so much bullying and the level of bullying. And now we can even bully um, on, on um, social media and not even see the person's reaction um, when they're being humiliated. So it makes it that much easier. But why are children and teenagers so capable of being bullies? Why, yeah. I see it as a social issue. Sometimes the fact that they've been bullied themselves and the way to be protective, self-protective, is become the bully. Um, they've been bullied at home, in their own home environments, or they've had some serious relational um, um, challenges in their own parent, uh, from their parents or their homes where they haven't developed literally brain development hasn't occurred for them to feel empathy. There's a serious decline. Mm. Research is really showing, literally um, a study in Michigan University shows that youth have a 40% less capability of empathy today than they did 30 years ago. Robert, can you teach empathy? You're at a, a school in a tough neighborhood. So I don't know whether you can teach empathy, but I think there are lots of things you can do within the education system in a classroom um, to create relationships. Um, when, you're in rel when you are relational with somebody, you can see the other in a, d in a different point of view. So before you can be at RFK, you go through an orientation program. And so every couple of weeks, the students stand up and do presentations. 
So if you know you're going to have to stand up there next, um, you're probably not going to be cutting down the person who's up there now um, because you can see yourself up there. So when we begin to be able to see ourselves in mm -hmm. different situations, so our bullying policy is becoming part of the teaching that's going to go on in orientation so that there will be role plays so that you can see the other situation. The students who come to RFK were not being well served in the traditional school setting for whatever reason. So we have students that were bullied, right? And they dropped out because they weren't safe. Then we have students that were bullies who were thrown out because they were bullying, right? And so um, zero tolerance can't be argued. I mean, you, you, it can't be allowed. But at the same time, um, that student came to our school with some real misunderstandings about how we should be treating each other. So the school, we feel, has a responsibility to make sure that that, that student who was a bully understands what that is and that it's not allowed and that we are in relationship here. So that if you want to be at RFK, you're not going to treat each other that way. RFK students then form a family and they really begin to protect each other. Uh, I can remember a student five or six years ago, I, I believe he came from El Dorado, his name was William. And uh, we have home teams that, that really do support each other. He didn't weigh 95 pounds as a ninth grader. And he, he, had a, he was a talented artist, he drew angels. He had a book of angel drawings. So at first the students, you know, were, were a little odd with him, but they became relational. And then every other student who came into that classroom that wanted to say anything to him, all the other students would say, hey, we don't treat each other that way. And so that really is, when young people say that, that's not how we act here. That's not how we treat each other. They are going to listen to young people more than they're going to listen to anyone else. So in a big school, it's a little more difficult. Robert F. Kennedy Charter School is a small school, but we work hard at being relational. And when we go there, uh, it's, a, it's a safer place. But I do think that students come to school with different levels of understanding. And so some students, I think, were bullied at home, right? When I watch TV, I see the lawyers bully the witness and the police officers bully people. And so it's a society that sort of perpetuates it. And then this is called bullying because you didn't understand the nuances. They, they need to understand the nuance, and then they need to be held accountable if they can't control it. But those supports need to be built in. Almarosa, can you talk about your role with the UNM LGBTQ Sure, Center? sure. So the uh, Don't Just Stand There, uh, Stop Bullying Now task force, it's a statewide task force, was developed um, in uh, 2010. And uh, the LGBTQ Resource Center was asked to be a part of that. Uh, something that we haven't brought up is that the statistics for bullying and suicide are at least three to four times higher than our general population, especially someone that's starting to question their own uh, either gender for, expression for or gender who are gay or questioning. identity, okay. mm -hmm, or they start to question their sexual orientation, um, or they come out and they start to really live and embrace the identity and who they are. So for those factors, they, the statistics are much higher. And in fact, we saw, um, I think now a couple years ago, uh, a, a long line of what we are calling and, and hearing about bully sides. People either being bullied um, for being LGBTQ or being perceived as part of the LGBTQ community. So this is really where um, we see social accountability and the, the bystander, because it is powerful because there's young people, if it's a young person setting and there's bullying happening, um, now with our social media and our cell phones, we have videos. You know, they're getting posted right away. And in those videos, the one thing I really notice is it's not just the aggressive action, but it's how many people are standing around watching. So what are, let me throw this out to everyone. What, what is the responsibility of a bystander? To stand up. No, it really, it really is interesting to see how many people will actually watch someone get beaten. Like I, I. Do you think they're scared? Do you think oh, they're? Yeah. Well, it's it's not wanting to get involved because everyone has so much going on in their own life already. That's the human nature: is to stay out of the way. When there's bullets flying, you duck, and that is what most people do. Is in a situation like that, people don't want to get involved. When you do stand up, not just you will stand up, but everyone around you will. 
it's all about putting, it's, it's, it's what my mom says, when you're getting in trouble, she'll put the fear of God in you. And that's what bullies do. They put the fear into people. And from that fear, they take whatever they want. Annalisa, why does Bernalillo County have an anti-bullying ordinance? It's most important to us that we have a safe place for kids to recreate and to be able to enjoy their time after school. And talking about the bullying incident, I think it's important that you know that 85% of folks are watching. And so within our training and within our programs, we like to ask that kids, most importantly, they feel safe before they do anything. And then they can redirect, they can respond, or they can comfort. And by saying that, we say that you can redirect some, a conversation as simply as saying, do you know where the water fountain is? You can respond by saying, please don't say that because it's going to be, you could be taken off the basketball team. Or, you know, if you get, you continue to say those types of things, you're going to get in trouble. Or you can comfort. And I think that a thing that we're missing here is that those that act aggressively also need comfort too. Because what's happening is, is they could be a respondent of being bullied themselves. And so I understand that there are folks that act aggressively, but there's a deeper nature behind that. And we have to understand that everybody needs support in that bullying incident and that sees these things that happen. The other thing that's important for us is that we can define what bullying is. And bullying can be something as simple as gossiping. And I think as human beings, we can all attribute to those types of behaviors. And we have to think about, am I being a bully? And you hold yourself accountable. And then you hold your friends accountable. Because I know if Alma or Brooke were to say, what you said in that meeting was uncalled for and you were acting aggressively, it's going to keep me feeling much more responsible to my actions because my own peers are calling me out on it. Is bully a problematic word? Because people don't think they're bullies? Or? It is. We need to define bully because everybody's using the term bully for every situation that comes up. Because not every bullying situation is an assault, but some of them are. We really try to talk a lot about moving away from labeling, particularly our young people, because as we know, and Dee gave us a great example of that you can move between roles. So it's just a behavior that Acting out aggressively is the behavior. We want to make sure that we're talking about that and because that's what we want to change and thinking about how do we change that behavior and that mode of operation. Alma, uh, uh, could you talk about the flash mobs just for a minute that you did to raise awareness? So it's really one of the educational activities that we've done since the uh, beginning of the task force. And it's really happened in middle schools, high schools, and at the uh, University of New Mexico. And they're really to engage not just the, the young people and the students, but to also engage their parents. So it's really building and trying to develop a new culture where we are caring for each other. So the flash mobs were an exciting and fun activity for us to really engage and start that dialogue uh, around the aggressive behavior and someone being targeted and to give the community the strength to stand up and stop bullying. The focus is really the bystander because as uh, Annalisa was saying, the percentage is so high of people that are witnessing that bullying that those are the people, that's our community that needs to step in. And the flash mobs are really a dance. They're to be fun. Um, <clears throat> we've seen them nationally, internationally, on YouTube. Uh, you know, it, we could have one right now. <laughs> well, no, we, no, we could. Right. <laughs> but like, the point is that nobody knows they're happening. They're this fun mm -hmm. thing. All of a sudden, everyone's coordinated. I'm not the best dancer, but I was out there doing my, <laughs> my shuffle. And um, so it intrigues people, right, as we are in this kind of voyeur uh, society. So you're watching something, but there's also that message with the flash mobs. Don't just stand there, stop bullying now. David, what's the risk of having really tough, stringent laws, no tolerance policies? It's a very complex thing to address because it lacks definition. Most of the laws that are passed at this point do not include research-based definitions. So it's the emotional part and the reactive part Somebody gets hurt, so they have to put all assaults, all kinds of assaults in it. Laws per se don't do as much as 
an effective cultural change. Robert has changed the culture of his school. And I think he very well described what the culture is. He's changed the expectations. It didn't take a law in order to accomplish that. New Mexico is one of eight states that has addressed it by developing policy in the, in the public education department. So at this point, I think New Mexico is in a advantageous position to make certain that there is a great deal of discussion, such as is going on here, in the development of that policy, so that it is not just a knee-jerk reaction of, let's get tougher laws. Part of the problem with passing a law and developing a law is in a, it is in a cogent, understandable definition. And it's extremely hard to define. 